Ah, okay. I see. Uh, let's see. Okay, let's have one of the tummy students do it now. Um, Rhea, you want to try it out? Rhea, are you there? All right. Uh, I guess we can have. Is Pan there? Pan? Hello? Why is no one here? Uh, Phoebe, are you here? Yes. You want to try it out? To choose okay. someone live? Um, I've been to seven countries before and I ride my bike to school and I am in seventh grade. Seventh grade. Hmm. Is it? Teacher, can we guess? You've been in seven countries. Can we guess? Yeah. I think you've been to seven countries is the false. No, it's right. So is it that you ride your bike to school? Right, right bike, right bike. Yes. Oh my gosh. That one's... How have you been a seven already if you're only in seventh grade? Oh my gosh. I wish that was me. It's okay. Uh, we'll have one more person do it. Um, you, you want to try it out? Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, I'm eating my breakfast now. Uh, I, I've got a pet turtle and I got a PS5. You got wow, a PS5? Wow, it's so good. Yeah, I just got a Switch, not PS5. Yeah. I have a Switch too. Uh, where is it? I don't know where it is. Is it here? Oh, it's right here. It's dead right now, so um, I have to charge it, but yeah, I have one. All right, so that concludes our icebreaker. We're going to start our presentations now, all right, guys? So, Brendan, you want to go first? Uh, sure. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yes. yes. All right, hi, my name is Brendan. I'm currently in 11th grade and I go to Beckman High School. And today I'll be presenting to you guys the food culture here in California. So the first thing I wanna talk about is fast food. So fast food is like a type of restaurant here where a lot of people go there because the food is good and it's also convenient. So people usually go there during lunch, uh, during lunch rush when they're trying to get back to work or something. So the first type of fast food restaurant is In-N-Out. So In-N-Out was founded in 1948 and opened its first store in Baldwin, California. The restaurant is known for its burgers and milkshakes as well as, it, as its animal fries. And the, food, the fast food chain is mostly located along the west coast of the US. So it's mainly like in California but you can also find it in Texas and Utah. Another one is McDonald's. Uh, McDonald's isn't just located in the US. It also, um, it also has more than 40,000 locations worldwide. Uh, but like In-N-Out, McDonald's also opened during the 1940s. They provide burgers and French fries, but also include other items like salad, chicken, and fish. So the next type of restaurant I want to talk about is steakhouses. And the first one is Outback Steakhouse. So this restaurant first started out in Florida, and it has since then expanded to over 20 countries, featuring Australian-themed uh, uh, designs and serves American cuisine. So they're known for their grilled steaks, chicken, and seafood. And they're also a great place for fine dining for the weekends or when you're just trying to relax. 
The next one is Mastro Steakhouse. So this one is a bit more higher class than the last one. Uh, it's a collection of sophisticated classic steakhouses. And it's also important to know that you have to dress nicely in order to eat at this restaurant. And they're also recognized for their excellent service and great cuisines. So the next thing I wanna talk about is holiday feasts and what we do during the holidays here in our culture in California. So the first one is Christmas. It's uh, usually celebrated on December 25th. And during Christmas, many people enjoy roasted vegetables, mashed potatoes, gravy, and roasted beef. They also bring cookies like sugar cookies and gingerbreads, which are fashioned into many shapes and sizes. And the next one is Thanksgiving. So this one is around the middle of November and it's a main dish or the main dish during thanks Thanksgiving is turkey. And Alexander Hamilton, which was one of the founding fathers of the United States, once said that no citizen of the United States should refrain from turkey on Thanksgiving Day. And many people also enjoy pumpkin pies and apple pies during it. And thank you for listening. All right, thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Anything they want to ask? Uh, out, of the, out of the locations you mentioned, like what would be your favorite? Uh, probably In and Out. I feel like uh, their hamburgers are probably the best. I would agree with you on that one. All right. Anyone have any other questions? I do. So, Brandon. What do you like to eat from the Thanksgiving feast and why? Um, I think I like turkey, but turkey by itself is pretty dry. So you have some gravy or something on it. Thank you for sharing. All right, uh, the next person we'll have go up is Jason. Uh, you guys can see it, right? Yes. Okay. So, hi, my name is Jason, and I'm presenting about Los Angeles. So, an introduction. Uh, Los Angeles can refer to uh, two different things. Uh, either LA County, which is the largest county in the United States with almost 10 million people, or uh, Los Angeles, the city, which is the largest city in California uh, with almost 4 million people. And uh, there's a lot of ethnic and cultural diversity uh, because people from all over the world uh, live in Los Angeles and there are many different cultures. Uh, so that's Los Angeles on a map. Uh, and LA is known as a, a center of industry, entertainment, and culture, and is a good place for tourists to visit because there's like many good restaurants and museums, beaches, and parks. And one of the most famous parts of uh, Los Angeles is Hollywood. Uh, it's a neighborhood in LA, and it's the center of the movie industry in the United States. And so sports in LA, uh, LA has a bunch of like professional sports teams and these are like some of the main ones. So for basketball, there's the Lakers and the Clippers. Baseball has the Dodgers. Football has uh, the Rams and the Chargers and hockey has the Kings. And of course in sports, there's stadiums. Uh, there's the Staples Center, uh, which is home to the Lakers, Clippers, <laughs> the Lakers, Clippers, and the Kings, and the Dodger Stadium, which is home to obviously the Dodgers. Uh, this is a picture of the Staples Center. And this is uh, the Dodger Stadium. So next, uh, let's talk about attractions in Los Angeles. So the first is uh, Universal Studios Hollywood. And it's uh, a movie themed amusement park. And it has a ton of like attractions and rides based on popular movies and TV shows. 
uh, such as Harry Potter, uh, Jurassic Park, and The Simpsons. And uh, there's a bunch of like gift shops and restaurants where you can go while you're there. Uh, on the left is a Harry Potter themed ride called uh, The Flight of the Hippogriff. And then on the right is uh, the studio tour where you get to get a behind the scenes look at how uh, they produce movies and uh, see special effects. Uh, the next is Disneyland Resort. And so it's a theme park based on Disney. So it, uh, so it includes like Star Wars and Marvel and their animated films. Uh, and Disneyland Resort also in, uh, includes both Disneyland Park and uh, California Adventure Park. So on the left is uh, the Pirates of the Caribbean ride, which is one of the uh, which is one of the more famous rides that Disneyland Park has. And then on the right is uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy uh, Mission Breakout ride, which is one of the more popular rides at uh, California Adventure Park. Uh, so next is uh, Huntington Library. And uh, even though it's called Huntington Library, it's, uh, it's also a museum and a garden. Uh, the museums uh, feature mostly European and American art. And the library has uh, many rare manuscripts. Uh, the gardens are considered some of the most beautiful gardens in the world. Uh, and uh, they're known for their Chinese and Japanese gardens. Uh, so on the left is a painting called uh, Blue Boy, and it's probably the most famous painting that uh, in the Huntington Library. Uh, on the top right is a picture like in the Chinese garden. And then below that is uh, the Gutenberg Bible, which is like one uh, famous because it's one of the first books to be mass printed in Europe. Next is the Getty Center and Villa. Uh, and they're not like, ah, never mind. Uh, so the Getty Center is a museum and research complex, which features uh, a wide range of art, uh, mostly Western art uh, from the Middle Ages all the way to the present. And then the Getty Villa is uh, modeled after a Roman villa. And a villa is basically just like an ancient Roman mansion. And the Getty Villa uh, has a bunch of Greek, Roman, and Etruscan art. Uh, it is no, known for its Greek and Roman collection. And then this is uh, a very famous uh, sculpture in the Getty Villa. It's the Lansdowne Heracles or Hercules. And that's it. Thank you for listening. Any questions? All right, thank you for your presentation. Anyone have any questions for him? Mm. What's your favorite team in LA? Mm, I don't really follow sports, but I guess the Lakers. The Lakers? Mm, okay, okay. All right, thank you for your presentation. Uh, Ethan, would you like to go up next? Sure, sure, sure. Let me pull it up. Uh, let me know when it's up. Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Hey, uh, oh, shoot. <laughs> Hi, guys. My name is Ethan Lowe. And today I'm going to be recommending some beaches in California. First on our list is Santa Monica Beach. Now, the first thing you can probably see in these pictures to the right is that there is a carnival. So that is probably one of the highly like prized parts of Santa Monica Beach. Beach, not peach, sorry. Beach because it is very entertaining there and there's lots of things to do. It's overall just a very fun place. In addition to the carnival, there is a pier. And a pier is like a long wooden plank that extends into the ocean and allows you to have a much more interesting experience. In addition, 
There is also an aquarium nearby, so if you are unable to see any marine animals at the beach itself, you could always take a short trip to the aquarium. So that's all for number one, and you can see in the bottom left, there's a map that it's pretty close to LA, so that's pretty interesting. So moving on, number two, El Matador Beach. Now, El Matador Beach is pretty much the opposite of Santa Monica Beach because it's not that loud and it doesn't have anything extravagant or huge, but it's actually more of a relaxing place to just you know, unwind from the stress of life. It's a very quiet place. And if you like tranquility or reading books, this would be a great place to go. So that's all for El Matador Beach. Moving on to number three, Zuma Beach. Zuma Beach is one of the most prized beaches because of its cleanness. In fact, it might be even the cleanest beach to this day. It's very beautiful as well as it is clean, and it's also very great for surfing. Surfing is a sport that is being done by the person in the bottom right photo. And if you don't know or have never seen that, it's pretty similar to like a skateboard, but it's on water. It might be a little hard to pick up at first. So if you do come to California, I'd recommend you practice before hiking the big waves at Zuma Beach. Number four, La Jolla Cove. La Jolla Cove is another beautiful beach, and it is well known for its lots of vegetation and extremely plentiful marine life. In other words, this means that you can see a lot of different animals here, and one of them is sea lions, which is in the bottom right photo, two of them just sleeping on the rocks that you can observe. Of course, you probably won't be able to touch them, but seeing them should be good enough. In addition to that, like I've already mentioned, there's lots of vegetation. So if you do love nature, there's lots of it here. It's very nice, green, and preserved. Moving on to number five, Manhattan State Beach. For all of you who like playing sports, specifically volleyball, this is probably one of the top beaches I'd recommend to you if you do ever come to America. This is because Manhattan State Beach, as it says on the slide, has around 50 courts. That is quite a lot, and because of that, most people actually do come here for volleyball, but in addition to that, there's also surfing, which, like I mentioned, is a sport and it is being done by the person in the top right photo. Again, in the bottom left picture, there is an image of where it's located. And as you can see, it's pretty close to Los Angeles as well. All right, now we're nearing the end with number six, Coronado Beach. Coronado Beach is probably the prettiest beach. I mean, you can see very clearly in both of these pictures that it has just an amazing view, especially during sunset, which is the bottom right picture. It just really does feel like an out of this world experience. And if you do like admiring pretty sights, Coronado Beach is the beach for you. In addition to being very pretty, the waters here are actually very clean as well, meaning that it's a great thing for swimming. So yeah, if you do like swimming, this is also a place you should probably go to. Moving on to our last beach, it's a Venice Beach. Now Venice Beach is similar to the first beach, Santa Monica Beach, in the sense that there are a lot of people here and a lot of entertainment. So this place is very crowded because of its popularity. And in addition to the street performers who may even do stuff like piano or do tricks or stuff like that, there is also other activities like skateboarding. Skateboarding is what is being done in the top right photo, and there's actually more to it as well. In addition to the vast selection of activities you can find at Venice Beach, it's also a very beautiful beach in general when cleared out, and you can see that in the bottom right picture. And once again, it is very close to Los Angeles, as you can see in the map. That'll be all for my presentation, so thank you for listening. Thank you for your presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, which, have you been to like any of these beaches? No.
<laughs> okay. Uh, if you yes, have to, you have. Uh, I yeah. can beat for sure. Oh yeah, yes, I have. Okay. Um, everyone, please, um, especially the students in Taiwan, your camera needs to be on at all time. It is re required for us to have communication with each other. It is not elective, it is required. So please turn on all your camera as a respect for each other. Thank you. All right. And I guess it's my turn now. So let me just pull it up. All right, there we go. Hello, my name is Owen Lo, and today I will be talking about national parks located in California. Oh, what? All right, the first park that we have is the Joshua Tree National Park. The first thing that you guys should know is that the Joshua Tree is not really a tree. It's actually a plant that's called a yucca plant. And this tree, this park isn't still fully available to the public as there are a lot of things that need to be kept private, such as endangered species of animals and plants. This park took over 58 years just to become a national park, and there are 57 mammal species found living in this park. Some of these animals include the antelope, the squirrel, the kangaroos, the coyotes, the fox, the bobcat, the sheep, and the mule deer. Some activities that you can do in this park are go with friends to go hiking, swimming, or camping under trees. Here in the top left is a picture of a campsite that was taken by someone else. As you can see, it's under the shade and there's a, a, a little bonfire right here. On the right, we have a picture of the Joshua tree as you guys know, this is also called a yucca plant. Here in the middle is one of the animals that you can find in the mountains. And in the bottom left is a picture of a campsite next to a mountain slash cave. Next up, we have the Sequoia National Park. This, the Sequoia National Park was the first park that was created to protect the trees and organisms. This park contains super large sequoia trees some of which grow up to 275 inches tall. This is one of the most popular tourist areas as well as one of the more popular national parks. In this park, you can go exploring, climbing on trees and mountains, jumping, and hiking on trails. This park is home to bears, deers, and other animals. Here in the top left is a picture of the sequoia trees. If you guys can see right here, there's a small little person, which goes to show how large these trees are. If you guys can see the little roots of the trees, they're already bigger than a human himself. In the bottom middle, we have a picture of a brown bear that was spotted in the forest. And on the right is a picture of inside a cave in which you can go see yourself. Next up, we have Redwood National Park. In this park, they offer a beach that you can go swimming and play with the sand. You can also check out the forest as they are full of trees. Some things you can do in this place are go to the top of the hills to watch the sunset. This park is home to animals such as the elk, rabbit, and fox. Some things you can also do if you stay long enough till nighttime is to sit on the ground, stare up into the sky, and see the stars at night. Here in the top left is a picture of what I just explained. When you are lying down, staring up into the sky and looking into the, looking up to find the stars. On the right is a picture of wildlife that's found on, the tr on top of a plant. And in the bottom middle is a picture of an elk staring up into the sky, trying to eat a leaf from the tree. Next up, we have Yosemite National Park. This park is very well known for its Yosemite Falls. These Yosemite Falls are a very popular tourist area, just like the Sequoia trees. In this park, you can go climbing the hills and you can go swimming in the rivers next to the waterfalls. You can go hiking, climbing, and driving under various caves and driving routes. 
This park, like other previous parks, offer camping overnight. This means you can go with your friends, grab a few picnic items, grab a tent, and sleep with them overnight in the, in the park. This, the Yosemite National Park also offers an Indian village where you can go see antique items found from before. This park is home to black bears, sheep, foxes, lions, bats, and other animals. Here in the top left is a picture of the Indian village slash museum. You can go in here and see the ancient artifacts that they once had. In the top middle, we have a picture of a brown bear that was also spotted living among the trees. And in the top right is a picture of a river that was taken as people were driving by on the driving routes. Here on the bottom left is a picture of two men rock climbing, but please be careful when you rock climb because it is dangerous. Here on the bottom right is a picture of a picnic setup where you can go picnic with friends and camping overnight. Next up, we have the Pinnacles National Park. In the Pinnacles National Park, they also offer hiking cave trails with bridges and rivers. You can go to high peaks to go see the many various views and sunsets, as well as this park is home to wildflowers. This park, just like the Yosemite Falls Park, also offers rock climbing. And this park is home to deers, bobcats, foxes, raccoons, jackrabbits, bats, and other animals. Here in the top left is a picture of a beautiful trail that is found under a cave walking over a river. In the top right is a picture of the mountains that you can find while using the hiking trails while climbing up the hills. In the middle, we have a picture of a squirrel that was spotted as, as this is its native land. In the bottom left is a picture of the many various wildflowers that can be spotted throughout the fields. And on the bottom right, we have a picture of a bat that was spotted inside a cave that you can also visit yourself. Next up, we have Kings Canyon National Park. In the Kings Canyon National Park, they also offer rock climbing as well as tree climbing. One of the most popular things to do in this park is to go see the General Sherman tree. This tree, just like the sequoia trees, grows up to nearly 275 inches tall. Here, you can go hiking on hiking trails, picnicking with friends, and witness animals such as the bird, deer, bear, fish, bats, and lions. Here on the top left is a picture of a waterfall and a little area where you can go swimming. You can climb the rocks next to the waterfall, but please be careful as it, as it is slippery. In the top right, we have a picture of a hiking trail that you can go see the many various views. As you can see, you can see the other mountaintops from this area. In the middle, we have a picture of the General Sherman tree. As you can see from the background, there are many smaller trees, which shows how large this tree really is. On the right, we have a picture of a picnic table, which helps you realize that you can go camping here and go picnicking with friends. On the bottom left, we have a, we have a picture of a bird that is native to the land. And on the right, we have a picture of a family of rodents. Next up, we have Death Valley National Park. In this park, you can go visit the basin, go golfing, hiking, and camping under trees and next to caves. This park offers a huge dune with tons of sand. They also offer mosaic canyon rock climbing, which is highly recommended to go visit when in this park. This park is home to birds, reptiles, fish, mammals, and other amphibians. Here in the top left, we have a picture of a sunbathing turtle. As you can see, its shell is very dry and has been under the sun for quite some time. In the middle, we have a picture of someone rock climbing, but please be careful as it is dangerous. On the top right, we have a picture of a huge dune of sand. And if you guys can see right here where my mouse is, there is a small little man. This shows how large the dunes of sand are. In the bottom left, we have... Oh, in the bottom left, we have a picture of a bird that only runs on land. This bird is called a roadrunner just because it's a really fast running bird. And on the bottom right is a picture of a hiking trail that you can go visit yourself while climbing on the rocks. Thank you for listening. Sorry.
Excuse me. Yes. Can you back to the last page? Yeah, sure. The last page as in this one? Yes, yes, yes. It is is it a de 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 desert? Yes, this is basically a desert. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right. Does anyone else have any other questions? So my question is for the Taiwanese students. Any of you guys have been visiting places like that before, like sand dunes or uh, forests, national parks like that at different places? It does not have to be Taiwan, but any places like that before? No? Yes, maybe. Okay, Juan and Chi, where where have you tried? Where have you been? You want to share that? I see. Please speak up. It's okay. I prefer you to speak up because this whole conversation is about practicing your speaking ability with people overseas, right? And it's okay to speak up. And if you cannot um, say it right, it's okay because we all start learning, right? So please do speak up if you can. This is a great opportunity for you, okay? And we're here to interact with you, okay? Dubai is a great place. That's where I hope I will go in the future. Have not been there yet. Anywhere else, you guys? No? So we welcome you to come to California to check out those places, OK? OK. Thanks, Owen. All right. Uh, next up, we'll have Ian go up. OK, so let me pull the presentation. Mm. My presentation is going to be on the species of America. So the first species we have the bald eagle. Uh, location, the bald eagle lives normally in northern areas of Canada and the United States, but sometimes they'll migrate downwards to the southern areas. The bald eagle also lives near bodies of water, like lakes or streams, oceans, rivers, all that. Uh, bald eagle's name is not does not actually mean it's bald it's just that it was from an old english word meaning white bald it's known for being the national animal of america and a symbol of strength courage and freedom it's related to many other birds like stellar seagull vultures owls buzzards and kites and bald eagles like living near uh, bodies of water so they can eat fish if they don't have fish they'll eat mostly eat small birds rodents and rabbits Next is, grizzly, next is the grizzly bear. The grizzly bear lives in western Canada. They'll usually live in areas such as woodlands, prairies, or forests. However, back then in the 1900s, they sometimes lived in southern uh, US, like all the way around in this western area, but they've been forced upwards. General Pope, the gr name grizzly bear is derived from the word grizzly, meaning horrible. They eat salmon, squirrels, hoofed animals, and carrion. They're, they're omnivores as well, so that means they also eat plants. They eat fleshy roots, roots, berries, grasses, and forbs. The grizzly bears are the symbol slash mascot of California, despite not being seen in California for over 100 years, or well, under 100 years. Next up is the alligator. The alligators live the alligators live in southwestern America. They mostly live around Florida. And the biggest alligator ever sighted was 19 feet and 2 inches next to Louisiana. General info about the alligator consists that their name is derived from 
uh, El Lagarto or Lizard. It's very, it's not very similar, but it's been translated and just kind of lost there. Alligators will eat insects, fishes, snakes, turtles, and small mammals. Uh, alligators have the third highest bite power in the animal kingdom, coming behind the saltwater crocodile and the Nile crocodile at 2,125 pounds per square inch. Here's a pressure. Uh, here's how to differentiate a crocodile from an alligator. Alligators have U-shaped snouts, they live in fresh water, and they have blackish gray skin, as you can see right here. Crocodiles have a V-shaped pointed snout, they live in salt water, and they have dark green slash brown skin. Next up is the centipede. Uh, there are many different types of centipedes. For this one, we're talking about the giant stessor centipede that lives in deserts in southern America. They actually inhabit all the continents of the world except for Antarctica. Name's origin from centipede is from 100, meaning because they have 100 legs. However, they do not actually have 100 legs. They have between 15 to 177 pairs of legs. They eat other insects such as spiders, cockroaches, moths, crickets, bedbugs, silvers, and on rare occasions, other centipedes. They're vicious attackers as they have extremely fast moving speeds and have poisonous fangs and claws, so you should watch out. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions for him? No questions? All right. Next up, we'll have Ishel. Hi, I'm Michelle, and this is my presentation about the different types of art. The first type of art I will be discussing is abstract art. What is abstract art? Abstract art uses shapes, colors, textures, and forms. It is art that does not represent or convey reality. Different types of abstract art include suprematism, geometric abstract art, and minimalism, but there are many different other types of abstract art. However, all types of abstract art share the non-objective and non-representational aspect, which means that the art does not look like anything. When did abstract art begin? Abstract art became popular in the early 20th century or the 1900s. However, it's difficult to analyze when exactly it began. However, it's commonly believed by many artists to be 1910. Which famous artists use abstract art? Wasali Kandinsky is thought to be the pioneer of abstract art, as he was the first recorded painter to not use any formal composition, which is how art is arranged, and his art did not purposely represent reality. The next type of art is pointillism art. What is pointillism art? Pointillism art is known for its use of small dots that create art. These dots blur the points into an image for the viewer. Because of this, pointillism is similar to divisionism, chromoluminism, or impressionism. Pointillism has a scientific influence because the artist needed to know where to place the dots in order for the viewer to see the completed painting. When did pointillism begin? Pointillism began in 1886, and it also helped lead the way to the Flavist movement in the 1900s, which will be mentioned later. Which famous artists used pointillism? George Seurat and Paul Signac started and developed the pointillism movement. Fun fact, the name pointillism was originally created to mock the art, but it eventually became the official name. The next type of art I will be showing is cubism. What is cubism? Cubism uses geometric shapes, collages, and interlocking planes. It also emphasizes two-dimensional planes, contradicting the traditional three-dimensional planes in art. When did cubism begin? Cubism began and developed in the 20th century or the 1900s. Pablo Picasso and George Braque developed it in the years of 1907 and 1914. Analytical, analytical cubism developed between 1910 to 1912, and it shows the analysis of form. After 1912, the, the advancement of cubism was called synthetic cubism, which emphasized the combination of forms in the art. Which famous artists use cubism? Some noteworthy and famous artists that have used cubism in their paintings include Pablo Picasso, George Braque, and Frida Kahlo. The next type of art I'll be discussing is Impressionism. What is Impressionism? 
Impressionism uses small, visible strokes, unblended color, and accurate representations of natural light. The painters were primarily Parisian because it started in France. Impressionism emphasized plein air painting, which means painting outside. It was also often called the first modern movement in painting. Fun fact, Japanese ukoyo-e prints inspired Impressionism. When did Impressionism begin? Impressionism began in the mid to late 19th century or the 1800s. It all started when a group of French painters wanted to remove traditional art rules, such as how art should be created, and create art that showed how they saw the scene. Which famous artists used Impressionism? Claude Monet, Camille, Alfred Sisley, and Edgar Degas were all the patriarchs or creators of Impressionism. However, Claude Monet is one of the most famous out of all of these, as he was famous for his series of paintings called the water lilies. This is an example of one of those paintings painted by Claude Monet. The next type of art I'll be discussing is Expressionism. What is Expressionism? Expressionism is a type of art in which the painting is a form expressing the artist's true internal ideas or emotions. Therefore, it is sometimes seen as a part of Romanticism. However, it is usually associated with modern German art or German Expressionism. After World War II ended, abstract expressionism developed in America, which combines abstract art and expressionism, hence the name abstract expressionism. When did expressionism begin? It began in 1912. Which famous artists used expressionism? Edvard Munch, Francis Bacon, and Vincent van Gogh used expressionism. Vincent van Gogh is most famous for his painting called The Starry Night. Fun fact, the term expressionism, expressionist is usually used during the 1900s. The next type of art I'll be discussing is Chinese art. What is Chinese art? Chinese art includes calligraphy, painting, pottery sculpture, jade carvings, and others, but this presentation will mostly focus on the painting aspect. Bird and flower painting is extremely common in Chinese paintings. Also, since fine art is a part of Chinese art and culture, Chinese paintings are usually painted using lines, as you can see from all these examples. Chinese paintings often use black ink as a key tone. When did Chinese art begin? Chinese art dates back to ancient China. However, the earliest found Chinese art was created in the 6th millennium BC. Chinese art was often in black and white because many Chinese artists read color as a distraction. These are all famous Chinese artists that use the Chinese painting style. The next type of art I'll be discussing is Romanticism. What is Romanticism? Romanticism places an emphasis on independence, imagination, and emotions. Therefore, it also opposes common subjects such as harmony, balance, order, and reasonableness. It can be used in any form, ranging from literature, architecture, art, and music. It also values inspiration and originality. It includes a search for individual rights or liberty, which means freedom. When did Romanticism begin? Romanticism spread throughout the United States and Europe during the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. Which famous artists used Romanticism? Thomas Cole, John Constable, William Blake, and J.M.W. Turner all use this art style. However, this art style is probably most popularly known for its music aspect. The, the final type of art I'll be showing is Fauvism. What is Fauvism? Fauvism uses forceful brushwork and bright, bold colors. It is a style of a group called the Fauves, which is why it is called Fauvism. It is also similar to abstract art. Fauvists were interested in color theory, especially complementary colors, which are colors that are opposite to each other on the color roll. An example of complementary colors include red and green. When did Fauvism begin? Fauvism as a style began in 1904 and continued past 1910, but Fauvism as a movement only lasted from the years of 1905 to 1908. Fauvism was one of the leading art movements throughout the 20th century alongside avant-garde, another popular art movement. Which famous artists used Fauvism? Henry Matisse and André de Rain are some fam famous Fauvism artists. Thank you for watching and listening to my presentation about the different types of art. Thank you. Does anyone have any other questions? If not, then we'll have Dr. Judy Ling go up next. Hello, am I the last one now? 
Yes. Okay, thank you. Hold on one second. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, thank you. So since I can only see this presentation, I cannot see you. If there's any questions or comments, or if I need to ask questions, please speak up because I cannot see the typings, okay? So today my presentation is about my professions. And I have two professions. I just got back from work which is the hospital. So can you guess what I do, Taiwanese students? I cannot hear you. No. Pharmacist. Said it again. Pharmacy? Yes, pharmacist. pharmacist. Yes. So I have a degree, which is doctor in pharmacy, which is very different than the way pharmacists are trained and educated in Taiwan. So here is a very stringent program that we do. It's highly regulated. Um, what I do is um, I do not work inside a pharmacy. I am more in the academic field of the pharmacy uh, pharmacist uh, job. So you can see pharmacist here, it says it's a person who is professionally qualified to prepare and dispense medicinal drugs, which I am qualified. Um, however, I don't do that. I am, uh, my what I do daily basis is that I do meet up with physicians, which is doctors, nurses, case managers, um, physical therapists, occupational therapists, we work together to improve the value and outcome from medicines and consults with and treats patients directly inside the hospital. So want to kind of uh, briefly talk about the pathway to become a pharmacist uh, in the United States, at least for my pathway. Um, I came to United States from Taiwan uh, in high school. So I went through four years of high school and then gone through four years of college or university, received a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry degree. Then I went on for additional four years of graduate school, which is a pharmacy school. At the time that I applied, it was very hard to get in. It's similar to medical school, like a medical doctor. It's a very stringent process um, to filter out who is best qualified to be a pharmacist. So I received doctor's degree in pharmacy uh, more than 20 years ago, um, did the examination, California board examination and become a licensed pharmacist. Then I decided to go for further academic uh, advancement so I did postdoctoral degree uh, residency at the hospital, which is considered academically and clinically advanced. So if you want, uh, you can also advance further academically, which is more residency. And most of the people go for a management program or something more specialized, such as oncology, critical care, neonatal cardiology. However, if you wanna do that, I would recommend you to do fellowship which involves quite a bit of research. And that is a two year program. Um, oncology means study of cancer, okay? Critical care meaning study of somebody who's really sick. Neonatal is a study for newborn diseases. Cardiology is a study of the heart diseases and so on. And like I said, I've been a uh, licensed pharmacist for more than 20 years. And I practiced at the same hospital for the last 20 years. So any questions so far? No, I'll move on, okay? So 
I'm not just a clinical pharmacist. What else do I do? This picture is a giveaway. A Chinese doctor. You can say that as well. Um, Chinese here, medicine. Say that again. Chinese medicines. Correct. So I am also an acupuncturist slash herbalist here. And the degree I have is called DAIM, which is Doctor of Acupuncture and Integrative Medicine. So the basic requirement for here in the United States is different than Asia. In Asia, it's very, um, it, it's really strenuous training to be an acupuncturist and herbalist. Here, the training is not as aggressive, it's not as intensive. Um, so what you do is um, after you finish college, in my case, I already have college uh, degree, I went ahead and applied the graduate program. And the program itself is a four year program for a master's degree. And this is very different from other um, medical degrees here in the United States, because normally master's degree requires two years of schooling and doctoral degree is additional four years. However, here it's reversed. The master's degree in acupuncture and herbs is four years and doctoral program is actually one to two years. So after I finished, I took the board exam of acupuncture and herbs and became a licensed ac practitioner. So in my case, I wanted to advance further. So I elected to go for doctoral of uh, acupuncture and integrative medicine because of my Western medicine background. I find this to be probably more suitable for me to uh, further uh, help others in um, medically. Of course, you can go for doctor of acupuncture, which is focused on the acupuncture only or you can do DAOM, which is Doctoral of Acupuncture and Oriental Medicine, which is a two-year program and it involves research, okay? So that's pretty much what I do. And yes, I am very busy, but I do enjoy both fields and uh, feel quite accomplished to be able to think both Western and Eastern medicine and evaluate them to see which one is more beneficial for patients. Any questions for me? No questions? I know to some people they're thinking that's a lot of studies. Why would you wanna do that? When you get older, you're gonna find interesting things to do. You may want to be an artist. You may want to be a singer. You may want to be an electrician or you may want to be a nurse or you may want to be a teacher. You never know, right? Do you guys know what you want to do in the future already? Yes, no, just nod your head or do this. You already know? That's very good, very good. So what do you guys want to do? Can somebody speak up and let me know what you want uh, to do in the future? I question. Uh, Jason. Who is this? Jason. Jason Lai. Yes, you have a question. So like, why did you, like, because you were already a pharmacist, right? So why did you, like, choose to pursue the acupuncture and integrated medicine? That's a very good question. Originally, I want to pursue uh, medical school after uh, pharmacy school because I like oncology and I wanted to be an oncologist. But because of family reason, I came from a family of Eastern medicine. I'm the only one in my family that does Western medicine, which my parents never said no to me um, because of some family reason. And I had the opportunity to go back to school that's when I say, hey, why not? Let's see. Let's check it out. It was extremely difficult for me at the beginning because Western medicine is very different from Eastern medicine. The thinking is very different. So I have to learn to think, okay, I need to stop thinking Western form and learn in Eastern medicine form. And eventually I get to know more and more and more about the Eastern medicine. And then 
I learned to slowly kind of combine the thinking so that I can better serve the patients. And it's helping me right now. Thank you for the question. So do you want to be an, an acupuncturist now too? That's a, a very good field. <laughs> Anybody else? Somebody said that they know what they want to do in the future. Can you share? What would you like to do in the future? I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. I cannot say all the Chinese names because my Chinese is not as good, but better than Owen's. But Owen, you want to name some people? What, what want me to call them out? Yeah, let's do that. <sighs> All right. Um, let's have you ask a question. What? See you here. Who? Hugh. Hugh, where are you, Hugh? Here. Here. Hi. 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 Do you know what you want to do in the future? Uh, no. But I, I want to be a YouTuber. Here? Oh, that's a very popular one. Very popular. Have you started doing the YouTube at all? Do you have your own state, your own channel yet? Uh, no, I'm still learning. Awesome. You know what? It's never too late. Got to get started. Maybe you can do a little movement to us and show us later. Okay. Anybody else? I know some people are smiling. I don't know if they want to share with me or not. Let me think. Huang and Chi. You want to share? Do you want do you know what you want to do in the future? Or something you may be interested? This may be, I don't know. What is it? An artist? Very good. What kind of artist are you interested to be? Because Ishao gave a very good presentation on arts today. I have no idea. I just like to draw a lot. <laughs> oh, that's very good. Maybe you and Ishao can be friends and talk about arts, right? Very good. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else want to share? Or you prefer me to call on you? I should have a music with me when I call on people. Okay, I'm gonna randomly name the English list. Okay, Brian. Brian, do we have a Brian here? No? Harrison, do we have a Harrison here? No? Okay, I guess I've been calling the ones who's been absent then. Um, I guess, um, Owen, you want to take over since uh, everybody's pretty shy here? Sure. All right, so we're gonna do one more thing before we break into our rooms. We're gonna ask a few questions. I have a few polls for you guys, a few questions. Here. Wait, that's the wrong thing. Nope. All right. Let's start with this. Let's see. What do you want to ask? All right. I'm going to ask you guys what your guys' favorite... Um, I want to say dishes, but your favorite... Food. I, want, I don't want to say food. But I guess we'll do food. All right. In chat, could you guys type down your favorite food? If you can in English, that'd be great. In the chat, type down your favorite type of food. It could be hamburger. And your meal, name rice. in English, please. It's okay. Like sushi, matcha. Like matcha the drink or matcha foods. Angeline, you like sushi? Like pie? Okay. Of 
corn or corn okay do you like corn on the cob or like do you like to eat it with this something else steak okay hot pot okay donut okay vegetable noodles okay ramen rice okay pasta okay anyone else fried rice okay hmm, what do i like i like um i like i think i also like fries yeah or actually i don't think i have a favorite food to be honest i'll eat anything All right. Barbecue? You like barbecue? Do you like do you like to eat ribs or corn or what do you like to eat at a barbecue? Hmm? No? All right. Jason, I have a question. What's dipping ramen? It's like Well, instead of like the noodles being in the soup, you have it on like the side and you have like a sauce, I guess you dip. Uh, I see, I see. Like the Japanese style, right? Yeah. Wow. Nobody wrote fried chicken. It's like really popular here in California. Well, people just don't like fried chicken. Okay. All right. Um, all right, I guess that's it for now. All right, so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go, we're all gonna go into separate groups now. I'm gonna have one of the English students in each of your groups. All right, I want you guys to talk with them, interact with them, ask them any questions. Okay, and come back at 7.58, all right? All right I'm, gonna, I'm gonna open up the rooms. So you guys can just press okay and join the rooms. All right, in three, two, Wait, hold on. What? Three, two, one. Ethan, what are you doing? Wait, it didn't send. It didn't send you? What the heck? I was in team one right now. What? Why do you have two of you? Oh, it's in... in... Huh? Are you there? Oh, it, it says, oh, it says join at the top. The pop with, uh, uh, I'm leaving. Uh, are you able to get into a room? Uh, could you join room two?
Okay, everybody, turn the camera so we can say goodbye to each other. Bye. No, 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 bye bye yet. Owen is the host. You gotta wait for Owen. No, bye bye. Sorry about that. All right. So that's going to end it all for today. Thank you for coming over. Thank you for all the people that helped out today. Thank you, Dr. Judy. Thank you, Ethan, Jason, Brendan, Yishel, Ian. Thank you all. If you guys want, you guys can put down your email below. You can put down your Discord. If you guys want to contact each other. If not, that's fine. And yeah, that's basically it. You guys are free to leave. Any other questions? If not, then that's it. Okay. Thank you, Owen, for hosting. Bye. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you, Ishao. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, all the teachers from the US. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Miss Liao, nice seeing you again. So students, you are free to go. See you tomorrow at 10, okay? See you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Have a nice day. So uh, are this the same student? Did you guys attend last during summer? Because I think I remember Shipai School. Some students attend uh, in the summer, in that summer. But most of them are new. And you are, um, teacher Wang, Helen. We, we I've I've seen you before, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we see How that. How come story. you didn't say hi to me? <laughs> because I don't want to interrupt in the meeting. Don't yeah. worry. This is the this is interactive meet. This is an interactive <coughs> session. You're more than welcome to talk. Like I was telling the students, they don't have they don't have to do this. Okay, they don't have to do that. They can just raise their hand and talk because this is interactive and I want them to feel a little bit more comfortable. Okay. And it's nice seeing you again. And uh, um, we'll see, hopefully, you know, we'll see each other in the future. If not, then I'll see you on the street in Taiwan because I'm going back to Taiwan. Really? When? I plan to go during summer. Um, I think, Maybe I will ask Professor Liu if people, if the students are interested, I can hold a session in Taiwan. But I don't know how the interaction is in the Taiwan education system. Um, but I'll be happy to host some of the sessions in Taiwan. Maybe that will be just be online. We can face to face. Yes, yeah, I actually cool. prefer face to face teaching and interaction. Oh, and you're more than welcome to leave. I can talk. I'm just talking to the teachers because I remember one of the teachers. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, <laughs> Bye Brandon. Bye. Bye. Bye, Ethan. Bye, Owen. Thank you. Um, is Are you one of the teachers? Shang Yu